Well, it's good to have everybody here today. May Yahweh bless each of you. So we picking it up in verse 5. May Yahweh bless His word to our hearts today. We ended last month with verse Matthew 4, verse 4, where uh, Yeshua quotes, Man must not live by bread alone, real famous passage, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. It's a passage, if you go back to, was originally to the Israelites in the wilderness. Yahweh fed them with angel's food, the psalm says, manna that came from heaven. Um, but Yeshua being the quintessential Israelite, he applies it to himself. So he faces the first temptation from the devil. He passes the temptation. We talked a lot about the devil last month. We're not going to talk much about him today, but we talked enough about him last month. But look at verse 5. <clears throat> this is the second temptation recorded. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city. Anybody know what the holy city is? Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem. So uh, if you make notes in your Bible, some text you can cross-reference is Nehemiah chapter 11. That will describe Jerusalem as the holy city. And also Isaiah 52 verse 1 mentions the holy city Jerusalem. And also there's a text in Revelation. Revelation 21 verse 2 that mentions the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And it's called the holy city as well. Okay. So that's where the devil takes him. And it says he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Some Bibles might say the wing of the temple. Anybody got wing? Uh, extremity there in Matthew 4 verse 5. It's definitely a high place. When you think of pinnacle or, or wing or an extremity, it's definitely a high place. And we know it had to be in high elevation because of what he says in verse 6. He says to him, if you are the son of God, remember he's being sarcastic. The devil knows who he is. But he's fishing here. If you're the son of God, then throw yourself down. Basically, he's saying jump off. He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, spiritual beings like the devil and the angels that are under the devil's uh, commission and authority, they do have the ability to fly. So this isn't, you know, we're not making this up like it's Superman or something like that. This is a reality. And uh, they can come back and forth from heaven to earth. So... Some see this as a vision. We talked about that last month. I think I personally think that it's literal and that Satan, the devil, flies him up to the pinnacle of the temple there in Jerusalem and tells him to throw himself down. And then notice here that the devil is a very smart individual. He can quote scripture. Um, the devil says, For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now this is a quotation from Psalm 91. And we're going to talk a little bit about Psalm 91 here in a second. But basically in Psalm 91, there's this promise. He that uh, dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I learned it in the King James Version when I was growing up. And there's a section in there that talks about how that Yahweh will protect us with his angels. I think I may have quoted it last week in the sermon where I talked about the angels as the sons of Elohim. Is Psalm 91 a true text that we can cite and quote and will Yahweh protect us with his angels? What would you say about that? Rocket shaking his head, yes. Of course it's a true text, right? It's part of Yahweh's Psalms. It's uh, the Psalms that David wrote, at least a lot of them. The problem here is is that, and Yeshua knows this, and he quotes, it is also written, um, that text is not meant there in Psalm 91 for us to misuse or abuse in putting ourselves in harm's way. You know, if Yahweh wanted to save me, um, and I was in a, a predicament, and there was an oncoming train coming, let's say I parked over the railroad tracks, I couldn't get down the arms are down and it was an accident Yahweh wanted to save me um, he could if he chose to send an angel to grab me out of the vehicle and and take me away that doesn't mean though that I go to the train track and I park there on purpose and say Yahweh you can save me you have the power to save me that's what's called tempting or testing God right so it's like I tell people Yahweh provides for my family 
but he doesn't do it by me sitting at home, right? He requires me to provide by proxy, right? So uh, Yahweh will take care um, of a broke arm, but that doesn't mean you can't have the broke arm set, bandaged, uh, put it put in a cast. Um, so we don't want to tempt Yahweh. We don't want to put ourselves in a position uh, to where it's tempting or testing Yahweh. And you notice here in verse 7, Yeshua told him, it is also written, do not test Yahweh, your mighty one. We'll get back to that here in just a second. Why does the devil quote Psalm 91? Now, I didn't come up with this on my own, but I listened to um, a lot of things throughout the week. One of my favorite things to listen to is something called the Naked Bible Podcast. Now, don't let the word naked throw you off. <laughs> um, naked means that we're just getting down to the brass tacks and the bare bones of what the Bible meant in its original context. So... Dr. Michael Heiser is the one that puts on that particular podcast. There's hundreds of episodes where he talks about things that are pretty common and familiar among scholars and theologians of the Bible, but that don't get talked about much in church. And Dr. Heiser, may he rest in peace, he's, he's passed away now. He's fallen asleep in the Messiah. Um, Dr. Heiser wanted to change that and get some of these more theological and scholarly topics to the forefront to where we could talk about them in our communities, and he did. He did a good job at that. But I was listening to a lecture uh, by Dr. Heiser once, and I remembered it, putting these notes together. Dr. Heiser points out, uh, I think it's in his book on demons, that Psalm 91 was found in one of the caves, uh, what we call the Dead Sea Scroll texts, or Dead Sea Scroll caves. Psalm 91 was found grouped with four other psalms that are not in the Hebrew Bible. But each of the other psalms had to do with exorcisms or casting out demons. And Psalm 91 was grouped with these other extra-biblical texts as an exorcist psalm. If you look at Psalm 91, let's turn there. Hold your place there in Matthew 4. Psalm 91, verse 5 through 6 the psalmist says, you, this is the one who lives under the protection of the Most High, back in verse 1, that could be any of us. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages as no at noon. Now you won't get this from the English, but Dr. Heiser said that if you check the Hebrew text out, the words terror, arrow, plague, and pestilence are either names or similarities to epithets of Canaanite deities. And so it's not just saying terror like what we would think or pestilence like what we would think, but a particular Canaanite deity that was over terror or that was over sickness that did these things upon people. Also, in the uh, Septuagint version of this psalm, listen to this. This is how it reads in the Septuagint version. Uh, I pulled this, I think, from the uh, Orthodox Study Bible. You shall not be frightened by fear at night, nor from an arrow that flies by day, nor by a thing moving in darkness, nor by mishap and a demon of noonday. So then Dr. Heiser asks, why is there no casting out of demons in the Older Testament? We read all through the Older Testament, and we don't see any of this casting out of demons. It's not prevalent. All of a sudden, Yeshua comes on the scene, and what does he have power to do? Cast out demons. When Yeshua shows up, why did people think this is what the Messiah is supposed to do? When he's casting out these demons, and he has power over sickness and disease, and people recognize that he's the Messiah, at least a lot of people, the reason they did is because there was a tradition during the Second Temple period, from the days of Ezra to the time of, of Yeshua, there was a tradition that David and his son Solomon had authority over evil spirits. One of the reasons was psalms or things in the Hebrew Bible or in extra biblical texts like Psalm 91. The reason I point this out is that if Yeshua is the son of David, the chosen one, because we know the Messiah was to be a descendant of King David, right? Well, if Yeshua is really the son of David, the chosen one, he ought to be able to possess and operate in the same power that David and his son Solomon did. 
So all of a sudden, the devil's choice to quote Psalm 91 becomes apparent. I think that's very interesting. Brother Sandy. If you notice from the chosen, they would be casting out demons and stuff. Mm -hmm. But one of the oral traditions is when the Messiah comes, he will cast out a demon out of a person that is dumb. Because in Jewish tradition, he would ask the demon his name. Mm. And then to show that it was the Messiah, he wouldn't need to have to ask the demon his name Mm. because the dumb person couldn't speak. And he would be able to cast out demons Mm. and that would distinguish him as the Messiah as opposed to the other Jews. Beautiful. That's good, Sandy. Ginger? Don't want to take us on a rabbit trail, but a quick question. Yeah. So Yeshua does, further down in Matthew, rebuke the Pharisees. And if I buy bills, but cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Mm-hmm. So, if we, I mean, it seems like there was a tradition of the Pharisees being able to cast out demons. Mm-hmm. Is that, is that something we don't have it documented anywhere else? Yeah, yeah. It's not prevalent. There's a few things. There's only a couple times in the Hebrew Bible that it'll mention. I think the Hebrew word is shadim. Is that correct, Sandy? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's translated as like goat demons oh, or yeah. things like yeah. that. But it, but it's you. A lot of times you won't get it even in reading an English Bible, because of the way English translators will translate it as maybe an idol or a cast image. Okay. There's but there's only a couple of times. Now, I mean, we do have the whole sons of God episode in Genesis six. Uh, we have the serpent in Genesis three. Things we talked about last week. We have mentions of Satan in the book of Job and things like this. But it's not as prevalent up until Yeshua comes comes on the scene. Yeah. Brother Sandy. Can you show that some people did cast out demons? Because remember, the sons of Sheba, the ones that mm-hmm. said uh, uh, they cast out, and they said, Paul, I know, Yeshua, I know, but I don't know who you are. Yeah. And the man turned and everything. Yeah. And then to show you how important context is, mm. uh, Hasatan did quote it, but he didn't quote the other two verses below it, where it said, you also have power over the <coughs> dragons and the serpent. Mm. So... He, this shows you how context is good because yeah. if he'd read a couple more times he would have been saying you actually have power over me but he didn't quote that part yeah yeah that's good Sandy something else too and Sandy and I talked about this last week I think um, sometimes when we memorize scripture people uh, I've had this happen in the, in the last year they'll say well anybody can memorize scripture we got to live scripture and it sounds good, like it's throwing off on memorizing, right? And they might quote, well, even the devil can quote scripture, right? But we can't live what we don't know. The more we memorize and the less we actually even have to go read our Bible. I'm not throwing off on Bible reading, but I'm just saying you can get to a point to where you can converse with somebody about the scripture in such a good way because you have so much memorized and committed to heart. And so that somebody asks you a question about something and you immediately say, hey, that's Psalm 91, you know, or Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. We can all say that. We say it at the end of every service. Just because Satan can quote Scripture, we don't need to say, well, we don't need to memorize Scripture. Satan can quote it. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. No, the more we quote, the more that we commit to our heart, to our mind, the better we can live, the the better we can activate it out in in our daily life. So, Yeshua says it's also written. So he knows that Satan is taking this out of context. Do not test the Lord your God. When I was growing up in the Oneness Pentecostal Church, this was a frequent passage that was used to teach that Jesus is the Lord God. He's the Lord your God. Because he's telling Satan, don't test the Lord your God. And they preached it in such a way as though... He was telling Satan not to test himself. But I think you can see just by reading it, that's not what Yeshua is talking about here. When Satan quotes Psalm 91 to Yeshua, and then Yeshua says it's written, Do not test the Lord your God. Yeshua is quoting Deuteronomy 6.16 to himself. I'm not supposed to test Yahweh my Elohim. You see that? Mm -hmm. So he's not telling Satan. The scripture wasn't written to Satan to start with. The scripture was written to Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeshua is part of Israel. He's saying, if I did what you're telling me to do, if I jumped off the pinnacle of the temple and put myself purposefully in harm's way, I would be testing or tempting Yahweh, my Elohim. See that? Mm -hmm. It's very subtle, very crafty. 
Uh, I haven't heard that as much anymore, but I used to hear that a lot growing up. The reason he took him on the pinnacle of the temple too, and it wouldn't be a vision, uh -huh. because if he jumped off, the people could see it. Mm -hmm. And that would show, hey, this guy's special, maybe he's the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so on the temple of the, on the pinnacle of the temple, they actually had uh, things that were like razors mm -hmm. so that the birds would stay off so they didn't have to clean it as much with the droppings. So it had a little <laughs> bit pointy stuff up there. I see. And so he would take them up there. And then if he went down, the people could see him up there, but they wouldn't know who it was. And so he would be tempting God when he done that and everything. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. The devil took him, could be translated, transported him, just like to the top of the temple. Um, is this possible? Is there a very high mountain that you could be on and see all the kingdoms of the world? Obviously, the higher up the elevation, the more that becomes visible to you. Has anybody ever thought about this? Is this visionary? Is it possible? Is it reality? If the pinnacle of the temple was real, would that make this real? Any thoughts? Anybody got any thoughts? Does this lend credence? I've heard people use this verse to lend credence to the flat stationary mm -hmm. earth because you can get up high enough to where you can see all the kingdoms of the world. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Sister? Just the fact that I know you can, there's a point in... Tennessee or somewhere, mm -hmm. you can see five states. I've been states. there, yeah. <laughs> so if you can see that many in that one spot, so and that's not a very high spot. Yeah. I think in Stone comparison Mountain to some high Mountain. spots. You can see very far. Yeah, I've been up on top of Stone Mountain many times, and you can see a lot up on top of there. So, so it's something to think about here, Mountain Ginger. State also may be referring to, like we talked about with Enoch, and that there is a specific amount of mountains, and there's one that's the highest mountain mm -hmm. that... He gets to see, and who knows if this is literal, but also potentially something where spiritual, well, not spiritual, but something that's kind of, I don't know, supernatural, mm -hmm. to where those mountains that Enoch saw, there was one that was the pinnacle, it was the most, it was the seventh point, or it was right in the middle. Hmm. Very good. Sorry. Something. Very good. Very good. Was it a real promise that Satan gave him when he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, could he have done that? Think about it. We do have rich people today that could make real promises that they would say, hey, if you do this for me, let's say they tempted you to sin, they, you do this for me, you know, I'll give you $500 million. Or I'll give you, you know, uh, this particular house. And the devil would be way more wise and uh, crafty um, than any billionaire today. And so I think that his promise is something that is a reality. We know he doesn't have any power apart from the Almighty. Um, but wicked men today that could make promises and give gifts, they don't have any power apart from the Almighty either. But yet they can do up to a certain point what they can do. So I think this is a reality, Brother Sandy. Yeah, even though he's a liar, he is the God of this world. Yes. And so... Uh, Basically, he has the authority of it at that present time. Yeah, I think the same thing. I think when Adam and, and Eve, Adam was uh, held accountable for it because he was supposed to be the head to protect the woman. When they sinned in the garden uh, at the temptation of the serpent, uh, they fell, at least to some extent, into the hands of the enemy, the adversary, or the serpent. That doesn't mean that Yahweh didn't still have authority, but things have to work out in certain ways, there's certain rules. And Yeshua, the second Adam, what he did, he comes to reverse that. And so he took back what was stolen uh, by the adversary through his, through his ministry, death, and, and resurrection. Brother Sandy. I believe in the first few chapters of Revelation, uh, he has the deed back again. He has mm. the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Yes, I mean, everything. So I mean. They're back in his possession. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Verse 9, And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. And this gets back to the original point I made last month. All of this is a test to see, the big thing here is to see if Yeshua will remain true in his worship of Yahweh or will he do like Adam in the Garden of Eden and give in to the temptation. Praise be to Yahweh, Yeshua didn't give in to the temptation like Adam did. 
not throwing off on Adam. I mean, I mean, he definitely is not as powerful as Yeshua, but um, I'm not throwing off on Adam in the sense that I don't think that I've done the exact same thing that Adam did. <laughs> I have. We all have. Minus one, minus Yeshua. I'm just pointing out that Yeshua came to to buy back or to, to purchase what Adam had lost in the garden. Verse 10, then Yeshua tells him, Go away, Satan, for it is written. He keeps quoting scripture. Worship Yahweh your mighty one and serve only him. This is another quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So he's quoting from Deuteronomy 8, 3, 6, 16, and 6, 13. When he quotes worship Yahweh and serve only him, once again he's quoting it to himself. I'm not going to bow down to you, Satan. Doesn't matter what you promise me. I'm to serve Yahweh and worship Yahweh and him alone shall I serve. And look at verse 11. Then the devil left him. This reminds me, I was reading this again this morning, it reminds me of uh, the book of James where James says, um, submit to the Almighty, resist the devil, and he will flee. So often when he doesn't flee, it's because we haven't submitted and we haven't resisted. But we have the promise there that says that if we do submit to Yahweh and then we resist the devil, he has to flee. The next verse, I think, says, Draw nigh unto the Almighty, and he will draw nigh unto you. I think this is James, maybe around chapter 3 or chapter 4, or something like that. Brother Sandy. And if you notice, it was all commandments that he was quoting and yes, everything. Yes. And the reason he was able to come over it, that where it says submit, I believe that's the Greek word hupotassos, which is a uh, Greek military term where you come under authority. Uh-huh. And what he came under authority was the commandments. Yes. So he didn't lean to his own understanding and try and negotiate it. I mean. In fact, you never negotiate with sin. Sometimes a person will say, well, there's a lot of kids that need to be adopted. You know, homosexuals can adopt them. Well, mm. that's a true statement, but it's not a biblical statement. Mm. And when you start talking, then you're negotiating with sin you would say, well, it is written, two men can't get married. Mm. And so you never have a negotiation with sin. Mm -hmm. That's what Eve done. She negotiated with it. Instead of quoting, uh, she couldn't quote it was written, but she could say, it is said. Yeah, it is said. Yeah, (laughs) You're right, because Yahweh had already said, don't eat from this tree. You can eat from the others, but don't eat from this tree. Notice too, Yeshua won the battle with the devil. I think we mentioned this last month, but it bears repeating. He won the battle with the devil. By quoting scripture. He knew scripture. He quoted it. He didn't have a Bible in front of him. He probably didn't even have a scroll with him. Those were kept usually at the synagogue or at the temple. But he knew it well enough that he could quote it. And not just quote it, but quote it to specific situations. Right? Now notice he doesn't always know the address of the verse. Or at least he doesn't mention the address of the verse. I like to do that. Sometimes I like to say, well, Deuteronomy such and such. But some people say, I can't remember where it's at. I can tell you what it says, but I don't remember where it's at. I've had a lot of people tell me that. That's okay. That's all right. I think it says, uh, I was reading somewhere in in Acts where it says in the second psalm. It didn't give the verse. It just said in the second psalm. (laughs) So it's okay if you don't know the address. But you do need to be able to quote scripture specific to your situation, Brother Sandy. And the scrolls aren't divided where you'd have an address. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you're Mm -hmm. right. That's why they said in a certain place it is written. That's right. And everything. So it was up to you to know where the certain place was. Yeah. So there were like, for for him to say the second psalm, maybe Uh the psalms were divided off. Yes, yes. But you're right. Uh, There were no, like in the manuscripts in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, there's no chapter and verse divisions. You're right, Brother Sandy. So they wouldn't be quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 16, like, right. like we do. Yeah. Um, anybody else before we move on? Sister Meredith? Were you, you just said the second song. Were you gonna, did you have that in your notes? Because that's relevant to this passage. <laughs> <laughs> you said that twice. Um, in the second psalm, it says, Yahweh has said to me, You are my son. Today I brought you forth. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, and the ends of the earth your possession. Break them with a rod of iron, dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And now be wise, O sovereigns, be instructed, you rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Amen. Yeah. It's, that's, that's a great text. It's probably on my mind because it's in my sermon tonight, Psalm chapter 2. <laughs> but, I, I, but I remember reading, I think it's in the book of Acts, where it says in the, in the second psalm, maybe in Hebrews, I can't remember. 
But that, yeah, that Psalm 2 is good. And when he mentions, uh, Thou art my son, that text is later applied to Yeshua in the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 13 and Hebrews, cha- Hebrews chapter 1. Okay, so the devil left him. Verse 11, he withstood and immediately angels came and began to serve him. Notice the very text that Satan quoted earlier in Psalm 91 about the angels. Mm-hmm. It actually comes to fruition here at the end. He didn't tempt Yahweh by jumping off the pinnacle. He stayed true and at the end Yahweh sent angels. I think this is heavenly spiritual messengers. Mm-hmm. Angel can mean an earthly messenger too. Okay, But I think this is talking about heavenly spiritual messengers. How did they serve him? They could have, Brother Scott, one T mentioned it in one of our studies. He said they could have uh, remember, he'd been fasting for 40 days. He was weak. They could have flown up to that mountain, picked him up off that mountain, and flew him down to the ground. That's one way they could have served him. Another way is they could have brought him water and food. Uh, remember, Prophet Elijah was fed by the ravens uh, back in 1 Kings 17, somewhere right in there. Um, so the angels, some Bibles, your Bible might say they ministered to him. And that's okay, but... The word ministered, we think of like a, somebody's plaque on the, on the door in a church, mm-hmm. Minister uh, Jansen or whatever. But the word minister means to serve. It's from the Latin, it means to serve. So that's what the angels came to do. Somebody raised their hand. Brother Sandy. <laughs> yes, sir. And the chances are very good. They brought him angel's food, which was mazay. Mm. Uh-huh. So the uh, scripture teaches we'll eat that in the millennial kingdom. Yeah, yeah. But they could have brought him heavenly food. Yeah, it's beautiful. Very beautiful. Matthew 4, verse 12 is next. <coughs> when he, this is Yeshua, when he heard that Yohanan, John, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Let's read verse 13 with it. He left Nazareth behind and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now remember, he had went down to the wilderness of Judea to be baptized by Yohanan in the Jordan River. The Jordan River extends from, from the north to the south of the land of Israel. But he was down in the wilderness of Judea. Um, and then, let's see, he went into the wilderness... Uh, to be tempted by the devil. And so this says, once he hears about his relative, Yohanan, being arrested, he goes up to the north. He doesn't go to his hometown where he grew up, Nazareth, but he goes close to there, and it's in the territories of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. So it would be northern Israel. Roughly, what, Sandy, 40, 50 miles from Jerusalem? I think so. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere right in there, um, which you know we don't think is that far by car, but they didn't have a car, right? <laughs> They would ride an animal or walk. Yes, he would probably walk most everywhere that he went. Um, Yohanan had been arrested. Why Why was Yohanan arrested? Anybody remember that? I know you do, Brother Sandy. Anybody else? John the baptizer got arrested. The reason he got arrested is because he was a righteous Torah preacher. And he called out a government official on their sin in public. And it was Herod. He told Herod, you can read about it in the Gospel of Mark. He said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. So he was either committing adultery with his brother's wife or it just wasn't lawful because in Leviticus 18, uh, that's one of the laws of what we would call incestual relationships, too close of kin. So the only exception to... Um, an Israelite man marrying his brother's wife is if his brother dies and he's not giving her a child. Deuteronomy chapter 25, that's the only exception. Brother Sandy. The daughter that danced the other night when we went. We watched it on The Chosen. Uh, do you yeah. remember her name? Herodias? No. 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 Solomon? If somebody uh, could remember. I can't remember. So- Salome or Salome, I think. something that like right? that, maybe. I think I, that's right. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, it's helpful when you talk to the Christians They'll usually preach on it. Uh-huh. That didn't occur in the Bible. They actually get her name from Josephus, I believe. Wow. Yes, so we've taken it for granted because a lot of times good preachers, Methodist, Baptist, Congregational, mm-hmm. will actually name the girl mm. and everything. Mm. And so I guess since we don't read the text as often, mm. we'll hear it 
but mm. not hear it but every couple of years. Mm -hmm. But it's cool. It doesn't occur in our text, but they will use extra biblical texts to preach, which is cool. <laughs> that is neat. That is neat. So she had danced. The, the dancer was uh, Herod's, let's see, the, the brother Philip's wife. It was her daughter, mm -hmm. right, was the dancer. She danced at this, like, this banquet that Herod had. And because um, this lady that Herod was in an unlawful relationship with, she was upset with John the Baptizer for calling them out in public and preaching against them. And so once the dance took place, um, Herod liked the dance, and he said, uh, you know, I'll give you anything you request up to a certain percentage of my kingdom. And because her mother had told her, ask for John the Baptizer's head on a silver platter. And that was, we watched it. They, they portrayed it really well on The Chosen there the other night. And it was, uh, I hate to be the one to give the spoiler. <laughs> but I guess the book of Mark gave the spoiler already a long time ago. But um, it just reminds us that uh, here, here John the Baptizer, he, he was beheaded. He didn't fight. He just, he just took the persecution, which is what we're called to do in the face of religious persecution. We're not called to, to fight back. We're, we're just called to you know, take it um, like John the Baptizer, like Yeshua, like uh, the guy in Second Maccabees 7, Eleazar the priest that wouldn't eat the pork, um, the mother and her seven sons in Second Maccabees 7, like all the righteous Israelites there in First Maccabees, that um, they still continue to keep Sabbath and circumcise their sons even though it was on the threat of death from Antiochus Epiphanes. They remain true in the face of persecution. Do you have something, Brother Sandy? Yes, yeah, so when the people go and see the Chosen, uh -huh. if they can remember the gentleman that was her trainer, and if you can mm -hmm. go back in time, he would tell her again, again, again. You remember that? Mm -hmm. That's uh, Proverbs 24. The wicked studieth destruction. He mm -hmm. hagogged her mm -hmm. over and over and over. Just like we hagog God's yes, Word. Yes. If you look close... That's what he did over wow. again, again. So it would be perfected. Uh -huh. So it would be mm. perfected. They studied, and it was literally true. She mm. was studying destruction for her mother yeah. is what she was doing. Wow. But that would be the Hebrew there, mm. a dog wow. in a bad way. Yeah, it can be positive or negative. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's very good. Very good. So let's see. We're in verses 12 and 13. He left Nazareth behind there in 13, lived in Capernaum by the sea literally there by the Sea of Galilee, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali region. Verse 14, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And then in verse 15 through 16 is a quotation of the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the sea road beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light, and for those living in the shadow land of death, light has dawned. This is from the, if you read in the Hebrew Bible, it's the last portion of Isaiah 8 and the first portion of Isaiah 9. In our English Bibles, it's usually Isaiah 9 verses 1 through 2 is where this is quoting from. This, by the way, sometimes when you read New Testament quotations of the Old, sometimes they'll line with what we call the Hebrew Masoretic text. This is from which your, mine and your Bibles mostly are taking the Older Testament from. Sometimes, though, the quotation, most of the time, the quotation will line up with the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. But then there's sometimes, like here, where the quotation doesn't align perfectly with either the Hebrew text or the Greek text, but the author is bringing across the meaning. And I like to bring this up when people throw off on Bibles that are meaning for meaning, like the Good News Translation, <laughs> the one Sandy got in trouble because he gave the Bibles to the church. <laughs> they said it's not a real Bible. Um, you shouldn't limit yourself to those type of Bibles. Hey, brother, come on in. But those are good Bibles. They're meaning-for-meaning meaning translations. They may not be word-for-word word or formally equivalent, but we have precedent for them in texts like this where an author would quote from an Older Testament text and he wouldn't quote it exactly word-for-word word so long as he got the meaning across to his hearers or to the ones that would read you know, his scroll or his text later on. Brother Sandy. And then what would happen is the reason he could do it that way 
as the people had sown, memorized their scripture. Mm. He took it for granted that they knew the rest of the text and could fill it in. Oh, I see. That's uh -huh. good. Yes. That's very good. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. We do that sometimes. I'll say, don't you remember this, Sandy? And then you'll remember when I just quote a part of it. So that's good. That's real good. Um, so this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Yeshua is obviously the light here. He lives in this area. And then it mentions in 16, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. So he's obviously the light here. It's spiritual. He's shining the light of the kingdom, the light of the gospel of the kingdom um, to these people. His message of repentance and uh, the kingdom of Yahweh. People who live in darkness. It mentions the Galilee of the Gentiles. Anybody got any thoughts on why it would call it that? Galilee of the Gentiles. I've got a few interpretations here. Sandy, do you know anything about that? Why it's called Galilee of the Gentiles? I've just been taught it was so overrun with... The so Gentiles. overrun with Gentiles. That's a prevalent view. That's one of the views that some take this as this area was inundated with non-Israelite or non-Jewish peoples. And that's definitely one way that the word Gentiles can be used here. Um, other people take it as metaphorically Gentiles. The word Gentile sometimes just means heathens. And some theologians take it as it's a reference to unfaithful Jewish people being called Gentiles. And then other people see it as a reference to this was actually one of the first areas taken away into Assyrian captivity because it was in northern Israel. And so this had been like a, a gloomy region um, in uh, the recent past from, from when this took place. But when Yeshua goes and lives in this region of heathens, whether non-Jews, unfaithful Jews, or if it's a reference to the, one of the first places uh, the Assyrians took captives from uh, before the uh, coming, coming back from exile, Yeshua lights up the place with his presence. Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. It's beautiful. In verse 17... From then on, Yeshua began to preach. He begins his preaching ministry here. Remember, he's 30 years old. That doesn't mean he didn't discuss the Torah. We know when he was 12 years old, he had discussions with the elders there in the temple. And they were amazed at the wisdom that this little 12-year-old Hebrew boy had. Uh, but at this point, he begins to preach. And what's his message? His message is not, I'm not trying to be facetious here when I say this, but we need to remember his message is not here from the get-go, I'm going to die on a cross and rise again. He actually doesn't bring that up until Matthew chapter 16. And when he brings it up, he must not have told his disciples anything about it before because Peter gets upset when he tells him. His message here is the exact same message that his relative, Yohanan the baptizer, had in Matthew 3. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we know we've talked about what repentance is. Somebody give me a good definition of repentance. To turn, to turn away. To turn away from. In, in this context, repent literally just means like about face. In this context, turn away from wrong and begin to do what's right. Turn away from sin, transgression, and begin to walk in the path of righteousness. So repentance starts off as an admittance of, of sin. You'll never heal if you don't first admit sin. You'll never begin the healing process. So admittance of sin and then asking for forgiveness. That's part of repentance, but that, that's not where it stops. Then it's turning away from sin. And then finally it's turning towards righteousness. So you can't just turn away from that sin and go and do another sin. It's turning away from sin, turning towards doing what is right. So Yeshua was a, was a law preacher. He was a preacher of the law just like Yohanan was. He told everybody to repent. And he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand or near. What does... What do you think that means? What does that portray to you when you read the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand? Go ahead, Brother Mike. I've always kind of thought of it as meaning that we're not immortal, that you will soon die. Hmm, that's good. Because, good thought. You know, you see that throughout the Bible. Uh -huh. I don't see it as a point in time that's coming. I, th I see it, and, and this is just my... Yeah. idea of it. Sure, sure. I've always seen it as each individual's point in time will come. Mm -hmm. Because nobody was going to live forever. Yeah. There, there would be a time where when you pass, then, then it's it's over for you. Yeah. So repent now 
because mm. nobody knows when their time's coming. That's a great thought, brother. Very good thought. So whether whether or not Yeshua's got another 30 years or 300 years to come back, we don't know if this could be our last day on the earth. Exactly. So repent, for the kingdom could be near to you. It's a great thought. Great thought. Anybody else? Sandy? The rabbis have a saying, which is really cool. Some of them, they said, uh, repent one day before you die. And the students will say, well, how do you know when you're going to die? And they say, that's why you repent today, <laughs> which was cool. But uh, mm. the kingdom of heaven, it has to do with bursting forth. Mm. So it goes back to where you have the sheep inside a sheepfold. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is at the right time, the shepherd would move. And because they wanted to go out, they would be squeezing themselves. Mm. And sometimes it's like, violent men take the kingdom mm. well they're pushing to go forth and he said the kingdom of heaven is upon you because i cast out demons mm. and uh it's beginning to come and everything yeah so it's here yeah. but not yet yes 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 there's a sense in it and it's here i like to think of it that yeshua is the king he's the appointed king of the kingdom of yahweh and because he's there literally the kingdom is at their grasp it's near it's right at the door Right here in verse 23, we'll talk about this more uh, in a later time, but it says, Yeshua was going all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Good news is gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. You tell people what, you ask people what the gospel is nowadays, and a lot of Christians say, well, it's the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's, that's a big part of the gospel, right? We, we believe that, we teach that. But before that, it's the gospel of the kingdom, the king and his dominion that the world as we know it will one day be gone and it'll all be righteousness and beauty under Yahweh's authority. But notice right here, after he preaches the gospel of the kingdom, it says, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You're going to find this associated with Yeshua's kingdom preaching and it's because in the final kingdom, in the new heavens and the new earth, Revelation 21, there's no more pain there's no more sickness. There's no more disease. And so in Yeshua, in his ministry, he brought the kingdom near to them because he would heal people of their sicknesses and he would cast demons out of people. That's one way that the kingdom was real close and near to them. I mean, imagine. it's uh, Brother TJ preached on this a couple weeks ago. It's not prevalent in the New Testament. And actually, I went back, it's not prevalent even in the Older Testament that you have a prophet with the gift of healing. It's very rare. You don't see it much, in, even in the Old Testament. When Yeshua comes, it's like boom, 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 boom. It's like everywhere he goes. He's not healing every single person, but he's doing more healings than anybody has ever seen. And remember, no prophet had even arisen since prophet, what, prophet Malachi and the uh, days of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. There was, some people call it the uh, 400 years of silence, and I'm not sure I agree completely with that, but but there was no prophet since Malachi for 400 years until Yohanan the baptizer. And then Yeshua is another prophet. But as great as Yohanan the baptizer was, we don't see anything in Scripture of him healing people of their diseases and sicknesses or casting out demons. That wasn't his place, right? We're one body and many members. But Yeshua, he has this ability and he's bringing the kingdom near. Yohanan could preach the kingdom is near because he knows, hey, I know the kings here. The king, king and me were born almost at the same time. And we've grown up for such a time as this. It's our time now. He was the forerunner. And then he pointed people to, to Yeshua. So Yeshua's message is no different than John the baptizer's message. They both preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew 3 verse 2 and Matthew 4 verse 17. Why should our message be anything different? than these great two men of Yahweh. Repent. You know, when we teach people to keep the Torah, that's really what we're teaching. To repent. It could be repent from anyone, any breaking of any of the commandments. Where, whether it's having other mighty ones before Yahweh, or uh, rem remembering the Sabbath day, or not committing adultery, or not bearing false witness. And we could go on and on. Not just the ten, but all those that branch off of, off of them. So, you know, when you're talking to somebody and maybe they, they say you, you think about the law too much or you think about the commandments too much, saying the whole message of the Bible is to repent. Repent. 
That's the message that John preached. That's the message the Messiah preached. The kingdom has to have three components. Mm. The first component is the king, and the next person component is the people that rule. But the second is the one that people don't like. All kingdoms have rules. Mm. So you have the king, people, and you have the rules mm. of the kingdom and everything. Mm -hmm. So the rules of the kingdom are the Torah. Amen. It's very good. We've got a few extra minutes. Y'all want to try to finish the chapter out? Let's, let's read it. Let's go to Matthew 4, verse 18. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. We used to sing a song when I was a little boy. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. In Sunday school or children's church. And Brother Sandy still mentions it, going fishing. Um, but it's a biblical concept. In other words, they're fishing for fish, right? That's their profession. But Yeshua is saying, look, you follow me and we're going to get some converts. We're going to go fishing for, for people, uh, for the kingdom, for my, my message. Um, fishermen were... Back then, they were considered low on the totem pole, I guess you'd say. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody and they've asked me, what do you do? And I tell them, I'm a septic tank man. And they go, oh, septic tank man. <laughs> Why would you want that job? And I always tell them it keeps me humble. <laughs> but uh, isn't it great that Yeshua is not looking at what job you did uh, to follow him? He goes to the fishermen. He doesn't go to the higher up, the upper shallan. He goes out here where they're fishing. And he says, hey, Simon, Andrew, come follow me. Verse 20 says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. You don't get this just from this verse, but if you look at the overall picture in the New Testament about the rabbi to disciple uh, scenario, Yeshua wasn't the only rabbi. There were many different rabbis in the Jewish faith in the first century. And when a rabbi would ask you to follow him, uh, like Yeshua says, take up your torture stake and follow me, meaning this is not going to be easy, it's going to be a tough life. Back then in the first century, to follow Yeshua literally meant you actually walked around with him and followed him and tried to imitate what he did. You would watch the rabbi, he was your teacher, and you as, a, as one of the Talmud, or Talmudim, which is students, or students, singular or plural, you would watch the rabbi and you'd try to imitate him, how he served the Creator, because he was a more righteous man than, than you were. And therefore they would begin to look like Yeshua. And Yeshua was the greatest <coughs> student ever in the whole Bible of his teacher, Father Yahweh. And that's why when you look at Yeshua and his life, it's as though you're looking at Yahweh and how Yahweh lives because he never veered from the words of, of his Father. So when he says to follow me, I mean, it's not that we can't follow him now in our, in our lifestyle, but in that first century context, he literally means you give up what you're doing and come and follow me. It's not going to be a prestigious life. We're not, not going to have a lot, lot of money. I don't even have a home. I don't have a place that I call home. But don't worry, we're going to go to certain ha homes, he tells them later in Matthew, and we're going to pronounce peace on that home when we go, and they're going to pronounce peace back to us, bring us in, they're going to feed us and drink us, and it's okay to eat their food and drink their water because we're laborers spiritually for the kingdom, and we're worthy to receive that material compensation. So, uh, Brother Sandy. Normally in that time, too, the father would encourage the son mm -hmm. to go but normally, the normal mm -hmm. way was you would go hunt the rabbi and you would mm -hmm. get to pick your rabbi out. It's unusual that he picked them out. Wow. So it's wow. almost right backwards the way it was normally How done. How about that? And everything. Yes, and that? you would walk with the rabbi so much till sometimes you'd have to go back and work with your father sure. and everything. Sure. But I think I had mentioned one time that uh, you would so imitate your rabbi, remember, Paul said, Timothy, you imitate me because I've been imitating the Messiah. Yes, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh -huh. And yes. then he said, what I have taught you, seven words in the Hebrew, mm. for wisdom, the last one, lakaha has to do with 
passing it on mm. to the other one and everything. Yes. And they yes. keep passing it on, passing it on. Commit to faithful men. Yes, That's the you text can, you're thinking uh, about. Commit yeah. to faithful men. Is so that they will te teach others. Yes, yes. So like some things that Sandy has taught me, I now teach David. or I, And hopefully then David grows up and then he teaches his, his son or other, other people as well. And then the thing where he said, you don't call anybody else rabbi except yeah. me. Because yeah. normally what would happen is eventually your rabbi would die. Mm. But then our rabbi is resurrected from the dead. So that's actually, technically speaking, one true rabbi. Oh, interesting. Uh, yes, that don't yeah. mean we can't call the other people father or rabbi. Sure. But uh, sure. your rabbis are going to die. Uh-huh. But uh, He gonna, rose from the dead. <laughs> I rose from the dead. That's and beautiful. That's and, good. And uh, they had said, I think I told you one time before, if you had to choose between your father and your rabbi, you were commanded to teach or to choose your rabbi. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was is they had a saying, if the Romans come and then they say, we're going to take them, but you've got to ransom them, mm -hmm. and you've only got enough ransom for one, you rabbi your, take your rabbi over your father. Mm -hmm. And then the rabbi said, the best thing to do, though, is you want your father to be your rabbi. So there would be enough. And uh, that's why I think in Proverbs it says, Give me your heart, my son. And this is a hard text. Observe my ways. Mm. So you're supposed to observe your father or your rabbi. Mm. But uh, that's a hard text. Very, very. That's good, Sandy. That's good. Verse. Look at verse, uh, let's see, 21. See if we can get through this. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers... James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So that goes right along with what you're saying there, Brother Sandy. Uh, verse 23. Yeshua was going all over Galilee, so he's up here in this northern region, that this very shadowy, dark area, but he's bringing light to that region. He's teaching in the synagogues. Synagogue there means a public gathering place, right? Um, this right here would be fine to call, be called a synagogue. Sometimes I do, I think when Brother uh, Sandy witnesses to other people, he tells them I go to this synagogue, and he calls me the rabbi. <laughs> 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 so so uh, that's okay. So, uh, all right, so he's, he's teaching in their synagogue. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's huge. Gospel of the kingdom's huge. It, it is the gospel. Um, he's healing every disease and sickness among the people. How awesome that would have been to see that. Uh, then the news about him spread throughout Syria. You imagine how fast news about a healer would spread, a prophet would spread. You, I, I would, if I had somebody sick, I'd bring him to him. Not that Yeshua healed everybody. He didn't. Everybody didn't receive their healing on this earth. It's okay. It's all right for us to suffer. It's okay. If we're in the Messiah, we will all eventually be healed in the kingdom of heaven. Some people get their healing on, in the here and now. But guess what? Even people that get healed now in this life, they still will one day have to die to this body. So whether I die tonight or whether I die 40 years from now, it's appointed unto me. I'm a, I'm a flesh and blood man once, once to die. So none of us will be completely healed until the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24, uh, the news was spreading, so they brought to him all who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And so all of these crowds are following him, um, the reason he can do signs and wonders has to do with his verification of being who he was, the son of Yahweh, the promised Davidic Messiah. Um, and because of his teaching and his, and his miracles, all of a sudden everybody's following large crowds. And then he gets all these large crowds together at the beginning of Matthew 1. He sees the crowds and he goes up on this mountain and they follow him up, up, follow him up there and then he sits down and what does he do? Yeah. He says, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you how to live. So it's not just all about healing. It's not just all about the fishes and the loaves. It's about being taught and living right. And then we get this famous sermon, Sermon on the Mount, that I'm very familiar with. And uh, we'll pick it back up here um, 
next month. Anybody got any comments or questions before we close out, Brother Sandy? I was going to mention how words change. Yes. Because a lot of times you have like the word Adar, Synagogue, Ecclesia, Kahal, all of those. Yes. There's some kind of gathering in everything. Yes. But to show you how the word changes when I tell people, well, we go to synagogue, that's not a Jewish word. It's a Greek yeah, word. It is, yeah. It's synagogue yeah. is what it is. <laughs> so it first occurs where it's a gathering of leather workers, people yeah. that produced flowers. Mm -hmm. But anytime you had two or more people that were together, mm -hmm. that was a synagogue. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when we're witnessing, we can actually tell the people, we're having a synagogue is what it is. Yeah. And if you look in Matthew 24, I always tell the Christians they're going to go to synagogue someday and they say, how is that? Well, in Matthew 24 it says, He shall send his angels with a great sound of a shofar and they shall synagogue all the people. So whether <laughs> you gather. like it or not, you're going to go to synagogue <laughs> That's someday. good, Sandy. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else before we close out? Anybody? We good? Everybody understands Matthew 4 now? <laughs> if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me or text me or email me. And we can go over them and I can learn with you. I don't understand everything myself. Um, it will be exciting to get into the Sermon on the Mount. I'm guessing probably next month we will cover verses 1 through 12. Maybe even verses 1 through 16. So you can be looking those over. Um, it's beautiful. This is a great, great, great teaching from Yeshua.